Amigo Pizza presents S S D P P P the Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. Let's go. Okay, guys. Hello. Ah, guys. There's, Hi. there's hockey stuff to talk about. There's hockey stuff to talk about today. Isn't that great? It's great. We that's two episodes in a row right now because last last week there was a lot of or last episode there's a lot of hockey talk too. There's some good stuff. We're we're looking at the light at the end of the tunnel, and you know I mean we've got lots, of, including a couple of Canadian hub cities that are apparently on the market. It's funny we're finding out more about Canadian hub cities than we are American ones. We don't quite know which hub cities are going to be in the states. We seem to have the two major ones in Canada, so we'll get to what those look like right now and how close each, there's one in the east and one in the west, what they look like in just a little bit. But the first thing we should talk about is the Toronto Maple Leafs making the greatest signing in club history. Bobby Orr. David Clarkson. Finish, Bobby Orr. Yeah. Bobby Orr with some finish, if you know what I'm saying. (laughs) (laughs) Here's my knee. Here's my knee. Ah! Oh. That was oh, a good one. Miko Letnin. Miko Letnin. Um, so this is a guy who was, the, I think he finished fourth in KHL scoring overall. He finished extremely high, and he was uh, the leader of Jokerit, of the uh, Continental Hockey League, and, and, formerly and of the SM Liga. Right. And, and where course, are they in terms of like comp- competitiveness? Are they a good team? Jokerit, um, they were, if I remember correctly, and I'll check this out right now, um, Jokerit was, uh, they were in the playoffs, like mid Gagarin Cup playoffs, and I want to say they were the first team to just say, guys, we're not playing anymore, like, because the KHL hadn't shut down operations, and Jokerit was just like, guys, we, we quit, we're not playing. <laughs> so, and then shortly after... They were like, well, I mean, teams are quitting on us, so I suppose we'll have to. That's right. the most Russian thing to happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, they were the third seed uh, in the first round of the West taking on Locomotive. So that's very good. Okay. Now, very good team. the reason that Miko Lettinen being fourth in league scoring is a big deal because you would expect anybody out of the KHL to be somewhat of a high performer if they're going to go to the NHL. First off, it's not easy to score points in the KHL. A lot of people, even a point per game pace is pretty rare. The second thing is, this guy's a defenseman. Unfortunately, though, a left shot defenseman. Yeah, which means then, <laughs> he's garbage and the Leafs shouldn't sign him, right? Right, right, because why would you want to do that? Now, it's, it is interesting because there can be a couple things at play here. Obviously, this is a player who wanted to make the jump. He's 26 years old. Um could have an opportunity. If he comes into camp and he bombs, then he can always go back. I mean, that's always possible as well. Uh, but I think they're expecting him to be, a minimum, a top six guy next year. And the question becomes right away, what does that mean for the rest of the Leafs' blue line, which is already thin, but already but a little bit stacked on the left side. And, you know, you've got Travis Dermott and Rasmus Sandin, Sandin, excuse me, they're already ready to go. Uh, you would expect Rasmus Sandin probably may be ready to go. Maybe he sees some playoff time. Uh, and then if this, you know, say the season starts in December, like we've heard, you know, by December, I would think with, with some of the games that they're going to play, some of the games the Marlies might play. I mean, I don't know if the AHL is looking at coming back or if they completely canceled. But regardless, you would think that there's going to be a lineup a mile long uh, for that third left-handed shot defenseman spot. Now, that doesn't mean that Travis Dermott – Miko Lettinen or Rasmus Sandin can't play the right side. It just means it's not optimal. And the question I think is, firstly, do we have a coach that's willing to explore that? That's willing to explore, like <laughs> TJ Brody does, playing a left-handed shot defenseman on the right side and sustaining it and, you know, letting him get used to it. Play, listen, the Leafs defense stinks. Play yes. your, by the way, I'm late, Dangle. I don't know mm. if you see, see my name there. Sorry, sorry, they're fellas. Um, they're, they're not good. Play your best six defensemen and uh, figure out the handedness later. Um, They're they're already thin on the right side. They're probably going to lose Tyson Berry. They're going to lose Cody Ceci. So Justin Hall, if I'm not mistaken, is the only right-handed defender they have signed back there. Oh, and Timothy Mm Lilligren. Who doesn't appear to be ready yet. Well, maybe you go – maybe he is, right? Um, 
here's here's the thing. So a lot of you know we joked about it off the top that Miko Letnin is the best ever, and he's Bobby Orr slash Nicholas Lidstrom slash Gretzky, but backwards mm-hmm. and all that. Before the Leafs signed him, people were talking about him, calling him one of the best, if not the best, defenseman in Europe. When it was rumored he was going to the Devils, when it was rumored he was going to the Habs were a big one, when he was rumored to be going to the Rangers or talking to all these teams. The Leafs came out of left field. So I don't know what the hell he – I don't know what the hell Kyle Dubas did to convince him to come to the Leafs, no bonuses. There doesn't appear to be any room for him. Obviously, they got to get creative. And they don't even have to get that creative. Miko Lettinen, uh, just last season when he was in the Swedish Hockey League, played with HV71, and he played supposedly the whole season on the right side. Um, He did say in the press conference call that he had played it on the right side and was capable of it. He didn't seem to be faced. Yeah, Riley's done it. Uh, Dermot has done it, but I went on my, uh, you know, bi-weekly rant, it seems, about Travis Dermot playing the right side. Until they do it, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to continue to talk about it as an option. Can I bring up something that sure. happened when this uh, when this came down? Sure. So uh, we, we were we were awarded the Stanley Cup. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> we All were right. in the studio at Virgin Radio, and I told Adam that uh, he had signed. And Adam probably said, "Does this mean Travis Dermott is out the door?" Because that seems like the logical conclusion. There's the thing: they're cash trapped, right? Cash trapped, and even if Travis Dermott makes Justin Hall money. They're just in hall bucks. It's too much. Um, like well, they can't it, afford it's it. too much. I think they can't afford that. Right. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? And Travis Dermott, you would expect, I mean, this is a defenseman who still, as much as he sort of has been, had an up and down season, ranks pretty highly among defensemen his age. And if you compare some of the better defensemen in the NHL now, they had numbers similar to him at a similar age. This is Dermott you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And Josh and- Morrissey comes to mind. Yeah, like I'm not I'm not ready to give up on Dermot. I criticized him pretty heavily this season, but like he was coming off an injury. Not everyone comes off of surgery better. Like Zach Hyman. Right. Like that that's a weird season Zach Hyman had and a fantastic one. Not everyone comes off it better. And, you know, there wasn't the first significant injury that Travis Dermot has had um throughout his career, but you're right, Adam. This guy is due for a race no matter what. Mm-hmm. So, what's it going to be? There is nothing but good news that comes from this signing. Either they trade Dermot and get something for him, they mm-hmm. trade someone else and get something for him, it pressures Dermot into a different kind of contract that's more team-friendly for the Leafs. The, the Leafs adding talent is never a bad thing. Ever, right. ever, ever. What I, I, I take Always. umbrage with people suggesting, and, and this Professor? is Professor? Uh, no, no. I just, I, I, there, are, there is a suggestion out there that, because this signing happens, if the Leafs trade Travis Dermott, that they've given up on him. And I think sometimes in the NHL, it's not about giving up on. It's getting the best value for him, even if that value is young, good, talented defense. Yeah. Like, if you could have Travis Dermott that played steady on the right side. You wouldn't need to move him. You wouldn't need to move him. Right. And that's, no. that's the thing. It's, it seems like such an odd thing, though, to trade a guy that you've had in your system for four and a half years – to get a guy who just happens to be right-handed. Like that just seems like, it just seems yeah. odd to me, mm-hmm. unless you can dial back the clock and get somebody who's maybe on an entry level uh, deal, who is only going to make, you know, eight or 900 grand for the next couple of seasons. If they see another Travis Dermott and they're like, we're going to trade uh, current wins for some future wins so we can keep under the cap. Like that's the only way I see that working. I don't see them bring, being able to bring in some big salary. Um, unless you're packaging a guy like, Alex Kerfoot, Andreas Janssen, Kasperi Kapan. You can trade Sandine. No, you mm. can't. No, I'm saying no, you could though. You could. You can trade anybody. You can trade oh, yeah. absolutely anybody in yeah. the world. Um, another option that I threw out there, uh, connecting it to a topic that we discussed on the podcast, and I don't think this is likely, but it is something that's possibly out there. Um, if they do play three and threes, because Miko Lettinen can't play in the NHL until next season. Right. Next season that we talked about could start in December, run through July. They're going to have to, they still want to play 82 games. They got to condense the schedule. If you're going to be playing three and threes, you're going to want four competent NHL pairings to carry with you throughout the season. That's true. 
not even to have, you know, chilling in the minors and then you call them up to be black aces during the, the playoffs or whatever. So I, I, there's, there's nothing bad about it. And I feel like it's very leafy to be like, so who's gone? Mm-hmm. Well, we, we know the answer. The Cody CC is gone and Tyson Berry is gone. Um, I don't know if anyone's getting dealt. I think, and people forget that, you know, you can also reevaluate once the season begins. Uh, so there's the preseason. Um, there's whatever's left of this season, which is going to be sort of this weird half season. But you can try Travis Dermott out on the right side full time. You can try Morgan Riley out on the right side full time. You can try Miko Lettinen on the right side full time. Martin Marincin's a left handed defenseman who plays on the right. Uh, pretty often it's not great but and this is another thing I think the Leafs really like Mark I, Come know. On. I think the Leafs really like Travis Dermott uh, and the person he is you know I, I think they're really big on a, on personality and a type of person they can trust um, so that's why I was saying Martin Marincin must be the best like he must be just a gem of a human being <laughs> knows what to get everyone for Christmas that this guy, he's always, he walks in with coffee every morning. He's never late. Am I right, Jesse? High five. <laughs> 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 he's just a gem. He's just a, a His gem name would be a, li- a little different in the Zoom. I don't think it'd be late dangle. No, no it'd true. be on know. time, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question. Sure. Why does it seem like it's been years now that the Leafs have had a hole on the right side of their defense? and they haven't been able to plug it with anybody. Why is it every year, every offseason, every trade deadline, they can't just fill this one simple hole that it seems like they have every single year? It's not so simple, unfortunately. You know, it's, it's, there's a reason right-hand defensemen get overpaid throughout the league. There was, there was a number yeah, of years. but if it's half a decade, it's a little yeah. more simple yeah. than that. No, you know? I know. Yeah, you you're five right. Five offseasons is enough time. And, yeah, and you're like, Justin Hall? Like, that's crafty. Yeah. But, like, now you're paying him $2 million bucks, and he started to stink as soon as you signed it. So that's a little concerning. Uh, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, but I, I remember for the longest time, the Leafs had a hole on right wing. They had no one. They had, like, I think Ty Domi was, like, their only natural right winger. And now they're stacked. But there's another hole. So what do you do? I don't know. They had Ron Hainsey on the top pair for two years. Mm-hmm. and I know um, the Leafs didn't want to do that anymore. Obviously, Ron Hainsey left. Mike Babcock got fired. But if the Leafs wanted to make that change that badly, if they hated having him up there that badly, there's things they could have done, and they didn't do it. So, you know, the three lefts, three rights, it's not the case for most teams throughout the league, I'm pretty sure. Can, can I weigh in on something, too? Mm-hmm. No. Uh, um, so Jesse, oh. <laughs> so there's a couple of things at play here. First, um, and this will anger any of the the people that hate Kyle Dubas and love Lou Lamorello, but there were some bad contracts that needed to be undone, and yeah. Patrick Marlowe and Nikita Zaitsev cost the Leafs immensely. You know that first round pick that went to Carolina for this season probably could have got them what they needed, but they had to get rid of, of Patrick Marlowe. They had to. Um, Nikita Zaitsev, I mean, it cost them Connor Brown, right? I mean, they, it, it, it was sort of like he's the, he's the throw-in of value. Um, well, and and you know, another, another thing they lack, though, Adam, just to add to what you're saying, is they lack toughness. And so they took some of the future on the right side in Sean Dursey, and they dealt yeah. it to the Kings. And right. the Kings probably asked for him directly because everyone needs a, a right-handed defenseman these days. Sorry. Right. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think – that's the, and I also want to throw out there that a right shot defenseman, the more I've had time to think about it, um, and it was, you know, I've really kind of been thinking about it since letnan has been signed and I don't have much to do. Um, to me, it's, it's not an issue if the Leafs defense doesn't suck. Are we talking about the handedness of these guys? No. And that's the problem. I think the, the, the right-handed part of the defenseman gets overblown. Steve, you made a really good point earlier when you talked about the fact that the Leafs just need to play their six best guys. Yes. We don't need yeah. to, to brain fuck this thing into happening. Like, it's just, <laughs> like it's just put them out there. Mm-hmm. Put them out there and let them go and let them play. You know, you, know what, you know what's crazy is that most hockey players at that level can pass, can shoot, and can skate 
at a pretty unbelievable le level. There's no reason. If they all don't have the right skill sets, obviously you have to trade guys like Polak, Hainsey, that sort of thing, but, or, or let, let them go to free agency. But in this particular case, the Leafs have a bunch of guys with wheels, with the exception of maybe Jake Muslin, who's not that fast, but he's a very smart player. Um, and you've got an opportunity here with a coach that's young and Kyle Dubas, who is young and can influence that coach to say, listen, you're not getting the right shot guy. We're just not going to overpay for that. We have, we have overpaid for star power, overpaid for star power. Like, you know, Mitch Marner, you could say, oh, a little overpaid. A lot of people say, Neil Ander, a little overpaid. I don't think so. People could argue that with Matthews. Tavares, I don't think you can argue that. Uh, I don't even think you can argue it with Matthews anymore. But the point I'm making is the money went to the big stars, which is the philosophy of the team. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, your overpay is over, we don't have overpay. Now we got to get creative. So it's on the head coach and it's on the players to say, how do we figure this out with what we have? And Kyle, I think, has always done a great job of filling it around the corners. He's always found, there's always been somebody else. There's always been somebody else to kind of step up and take that role. And it's either come from the Marlies, it's come from Europe, like we saw it with Mikheyev this year. Um, uh, even guys like, you know, not that Ojeganov was that great, but he was fine. He's he was guy. He was guy. NHL player. Like he wasn't. He wasn't demoted yeah. to Marley's. You know. I just, yeah, exactly. I and like they could have done that. They yeah. I didn't like him, that. but he was good enough at the time. And and this is what I was saying. You, the Leafs. It's weird. They've sort of constructed themselves into being good enough to survive having flaws early in the season. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. They're good enough to have a really weak right side, but probably be at least considerably above 500 sort of in a playoff spot by Christmas. And then you reevaluate and you go, okay, we kind of suck. Here's a move we can make. But we've already identified they have valuable pieces. Uh, what's going to happen with Dermott? Um, what's going to happen with Janssen? What's going to mm -hmm. happen with Kerfoot? What's mm -hmm. going to happen with Kapanen? So all I'm focused on is they signed – a guy who was referred to as one of the best defensemen in Europe before his name was even mentioned in the same sentence as the Leafs. And I think people are probably focusing on the wrong issue um, with the left versus right. If you have a left-handed guy on the right-handed side, uh, there's a billion in the league. Yeah. Um, At least wanted to get TJ Brody. Yeah. You He's adjust great. accordingly. You adjust accordingly. Um, if you know you're going to have a guy on your – right side who's a left-handed shot here are the two things i'm mostly worried about one um i saw this guy's highlights they're awesome um however a lot of the points he put up especially goals were on the power play how's he gonna get those cookies how's well, he gonna saying, get those they're cookies? saying with dermot gone sorry not dermot oh, uh with barry, barry gone he may be the quarterback of the second pp second yeah, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, like, he put up 49 points in 60 KHL games. That's banana sandwich. And also, it's nothing like anything he's put up anywhere in his career. Um, in the SM Liga uh, in Sweden, in Sweden, he put up 24 in 52 games. In the SM Liga in Finland, 29 in 55. In the KHL, all of a sudden, maybe he's playing with better players. He puts up 49. He puts up 20 more points than he's ever scored anywhere else. Uh, and a lot of that was the power play. So where is he going to get those cookies? You're probably not going to get a ton on the, the second power play unit anyway. And I doubt you're going to hand him the first because it was already enough of an issue taking the first away from Riley and giving it to Barry. Now, yeah. if there's no Barry, how are you going to be like, here's a guy we, you've never heard of. They've already tried. Uh, Muzzin has played some power play. Sandine's played some power play and I actually like them there. So it's just healthy internal competition. But how's he going to put up those points? And beyond that, the biggest issue, the Leafs don't have an issue putting up points. So I don't really care how many points this guy puts up. He's 5'11, a buck 96. Can this guy be a dick to people in front of the net? Can this guy control his gap? Can this guy uh, uh, clear the front of the net? for Freddie Anderson. Does this guy have a brain on his shoulders? Can he make a breakout pass? Can he make a breakout pass for crying out loud? Can he deny zone entries? Can he defend? Mm -hmm. It's all I'm 
all I'm looking for. Well, and, and, and to that point, Steve, just to add to what you're saying, you said it already. The Leafs are stacked on the right side right now, you know, on the forward, forward position. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So if you're stacked on the right side for the Leafs forward position, that should make it easier on the right side defenseman, should it not? You'd think. And that's, that's sort of the problem that I've been seeing for the last little bit is, like, you're stacked on the left – in, on defense, stacked on the right up front, and, and pretty good center as well, let's be honest. Um, but you can't make that cross-ice pass, right? You can't do that coming out of your zone. So all the defenseman on the right-hand side needs to do is keep it pretty simple. I mean, if you look at the Boston Bruins, who are the arch nemesis, there's no question. They're not complicated when they do a zone breakout. No. Like, it's a couple passes. And they make it look easy against a team like the Leafs, who are a strong for checking team and you know we've only ever seen the Babcock Leafs in the playoffs in this iteration I don't know what Sheldon Keith's Leafs would look like especially after a pandemic but, but it seems to me that if you could just find a guy like you said control your gap clear the net be sort of a dick um, have a head on your shoulders he should be able to like Justin Hall did for a good chunk of the season figure out how to make a pass to the strong side of the strongest part of this team which is the right hand side and so we're guy, in agreement that Lennon isn't what the Leafs need. No, I would no, but in a, in a weird way because he's we don't need more offensive-minded players on this team. We need people to stay home and play some defense. I and, think I think that stay home thing is a thing that they don't believe in, Jesse. At well, all there is the that. entire team. I don't think they believe in it. You, I think it's. I think they that's think it's, a, it's, that's a crazy way. They to don't have to team. stay home. They they need come home defensemen. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Does that make sense? Do they, they need have home that? for curfew defense? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. because they go to work. Mm-hmm. The Leafs commute to work. Work is the offensive zone. All but five guys. Yeah, they're late for guys. dinner almost every game. Yeah. They're late for dinner. No wonder they're my favorite team. They're they're always late. So we need <laughs> we need come home defensemen. If Miko uh-huh. Lettinen can commute to work and be a come home defenseman. He'll get along with the Toronto Maple Leafs and their fans just so fine. So do we have confidence that he's going to drive his car through traffic and get all the way home? Or is he going to hop on the GO train and maybe it's running late every day because that's what the GO train does and he doesn't True. make it to mm-hmm. Oshawa GO in time? Oh, man. He'll never make it to Oshawa GO in time. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you, might, you might get to Danforth, but you're not getting to Oshawa GO on time. Um, yeah. The The – Sorry, He's okay. So the, the thing too, is that I think Jesse, in a lot of cases, the stay at home defenseman moniker has gone away because, mm-hmm. and this is, this is largely due to the advanced stats community. Um, they basically debunked the idea. Most of the stay at home defensemen that we grew up with were just bad. They were just bad. <laughs> and some they of them were at home because they couldn't go anywhere. Right. They yeah. didn't have the, they, they didn't were have in the a wheels. pandemic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were told to stay home. Yeah, <laughs> dude, they were on lockdown. Like, please stay in your zone. Um, and I'm not denigrating guys like you know Adam Foot and things. You know, that there were are not, guys. There, there are like, guys who were good defense. Like mm-hmm. you know, but what the yeah, and I hate to bring up the last dance because I haven't seen the latest two episodes. We're gonna have to hold up on a review of that. They're pretty good. Um, I they need the Leafs need a Dennis Rodman, real bad. <laughs> yeah, real bad. And I don't know if it's forward or defense. I would like it to be on. Defense. But there's, the, there's an attitude that he got from Detroit, and if you haven't seen this, my God, you need to see it. It's, it's poetry. Um, that, that, you know, you could, see, you could see the Jordan Bulls teams, and I, I said this before, there is such a, at least as a Leaf fan, you can draw a lot from those Jordan Bulls teams at the end of, at the, end of the 80s. High offense, super exciting, not great at defense. And, you know, Jordan's winning defensive player of the year, scoring title, MVP, what? Can't get past the second round. And Leafs can't even get past the first yet. I think if you get, I mean, if you've got the talent that they have, you know, they had Pippen and Jordan and uh, Horse, uh, Horse, Horse Grant. Grant. Horse Grant. You need, you need a, a mean SOB. And I think eventually someone's going to develop into that. You see flashes of that with Kapanen. You see flashes of that with Muzzin. Um, and maybe it's by committee rather than just being one guy. But there definitely seems to be that element of, and, I, and I'm sure the Leafs have all watched that. It's either got to develop from within or they have to go and find it. And I definitely still think that there's room for that. I don't think they need to make an entire line out of guys like that, like the Leafs used to, an almost unplayable fourth line, for instance, which we used to have five years ago. 
But when we talk about where this team will need to get next, the high-end talent is there and it's developing and it's getting better and scarier and scarier. The defense needs to sort itself out. You need to have some come-home defensemen, but yeah. you do need to have someone who knocks people off their game. Well, and who are the biggest pests in the league right now? The biggest high-talent pests? Brad Marchand. Brad, Brad Marchand. Tom Wilson. Evander Kane, I'm putting on that list. Yeah. No, Tom, oh, Tom, yeah. Tom Wilson, I won't put on that list. I don't know if he's a, a – Tom Wilson and Evander Kane, I would file under power forward. But they, they freak people out, man. They, pull they do. Off their they game. do. Mm-hmm. And it's, so it's not – not everybody's going to be Brad Marchand pest, but I guess when I define pest, it's sort of like anybody that pulls my focus. Right? Because if a bug is flying around my head, it doesn't matter what kind of bug it is. It's still pulling my focus. The, the guys I was thinking along the lines of, and it sucks that you guys immediately went with Wilson and Kane, because where I was going was uh, Brad Marchand, Travis Konechny has Ooh, really developed yes. into that guy. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, where was year. I going? The Brad Kachuk. Marchand, Travis Konechny. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah. Well, no, Matthew Kachuk. Um, yeah, Matthew. Uh, and, and Brady, Brady Kachuk. Brady, Brady, Brady Kachuk is, tired, is uh, t- taller. I think, uh, I think when the Senators are better, you're going to see more of Brady Kachuk be that oh, guy. Yeah. Max Domi. So the three oh, guys yeah. I was going to say were Max Domi, Brad Marchand, and Travis Konechny. Max Domi and like, on I, and off the ice. On and off the ice. But then I was going to say, have I mentioned a guy over six feet tall? Have I mentioned a guy over like 205 pounds or 210 pounds? Like, That's a good point. The, 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 it was a mentality. Right. Well, and it was also so the Bulls were like, we have to hit the gym. And then they did. But, <laughs> hey, guys, I just exercise. decided to not go to the gym for five years. What if we simply worked out and then they worked out and then they won? <laughs> wow. What a great moment in sports history. The athletes worked out. Like, that's so wild that they chose to do that with their free time. Good for them. But, like, wh- and then a I'm year saying- later, Jordan's like, what can I bet on? I don't have a yeah. gambling problem. <laughs> oh, oh. See, Adam hasn't seen it oh, yet, I know, so we'll I know, have I know. to save that for Sunday. <laughs> Not there yet. Not because, there yet. Okay, okay. Oh, the past two episodes were great. Oh, okay, five so is my episode, favorite episode. So, so next, next episode of this show, we'll get five and six, episodes five and six. Uh, yeah. So that's your homework if you're listening to the show, just so you know. We're going to be going through those episodes and talking about some of the highlights from that. So Rodman, though, was the th- – was so, sorry, tying this back into the Leafs. Rodman was the second three, which we established mm-hmm. last show. I thought he was only the last one. He's the second three. The first three, which to me are the most important, at least in terms of the comparison. So the Bulls were no good, no good, no good. They mostly developed this different attitude, this different way of looking at basketball, this different way of looking at their opponents from within. So to me, you know, oh, we got to go out and get this guy, get that guy, get that. Enough of that. You do what you do or what you need to do to get the best team under the salary cap in terms of trades. Don't go out looking to change the entire attitude of the team with a trade. It's not going to happen. These guys need to change the way they approach hockey themselves. Otherwise, you're sunk. Yeah. Yeah. There was a point in this season that's still currently going on where it was like, okay, Dubas isn't going to bail you out anymore and make any trades. Like, there's no Muzzin to go get. There's no no guy we're going to bring into this locker room. It's already the guys who are there who need to change their attitudes and step up and start playing harder. Yeah, and they got Kyle Clifford. They they got Kyle Clifford, but like Kyle Clifford is not going to save you against. It was it was like in the same way that Colton Orr and Fraser McLaren were not going to save you from Zdeno Ochara. No, you have Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, Morgan Riley. You have you have John Tavares. You have your stars. Those guys who are going to save your season. The guys who are already there. Yes. Yes. But sorry, the point I was trying to get to is Colton Orr and Zdeno Ochara are never going to be on the ice at the same time. No, never, no. never, <laughs> never. And if they are, it's a problem, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you, you've got to change your attitude. You've got to change the, the way you play. Kapanen changed his attitude. Completely changed. He adjusted. He didn't, mm-hmm. like, what, what did, it, did someone give him this great pep talk? And no, I think it was a very short one. Cappy, go out and fight someone. Go be a dick. And it worked. It's uh, like, listen, you might get your ass kicked a few times for sure. But you got to stick up for yourself, which I think is an enormous problem for this team. I saw a clip the other day that made me go, that guy must be out of his mind. It was Wayne Simmons drilling Brian Dumoulin in an um, outdoor game. Do you know who challenged Wayne Simmons? No. Jared McCann. Who's the guy? Fight Jared McCann? 
Jared McCann, by the way, is the guy who stuck up for his teammate when Kapanen hit someone, I believe. And, uh, and then, so he went after Kapanen. And so like, I'm not saying everyone needs a Jared McCann, but I'm saying it, you don't need to be this giant bruiser to stick up for yourself and stick up for your teammates. Jared McCann is freaking he's a bone rack. Let me like, let me try to find out Jared McCann. I, I respect I was, him that he did stand up, the, you know, and we, we said this last episode, but the, the, the Leafs need to get away from, um, I mean, they don't, I guess they don't outwardly complain that much. Maybe no. we as fans need to get away from complaining about the, how the game isn't called by the rules. I mean, it's friggin' not, but, but uh, I, I don't know that that's going to help. Right. Like the that's things like not... the Chara flipping someone's stick with his own stick. Like that stuff. I'm going to complain about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> I will bitch about that. Thank you very much. Well, I'm because it's so, so ridiculous. Me. It's it so over the top ridiculous. But anyway, so I, I don't know how we got to the psychology session. Uh, about the Leafs from, uh, we're, from we're Miko Lehtinen. It doesn't matter. It's just yeah. all a big, long, winding road. The most concerning thing to me uh, about Miko Lehtinen that I've read or extrapolated so far from video, I was worried about the power play cookies. And also, um, he had the old job interview, um, what's your greatest weakness? It was, oh, you know, I'm just really hard on myself. And that what uh, he said? Just, he, I think someone said it for him. Like, oh, he's just, he's very hard on himself. And, you know, if he has a bad game, like, and I'm like, and you chose to sign in Toronto, <laughs> like over New Jersey. Yeah. Well, All hopefully right. he can't read English. Uh, I mean, hopefully. And it hopefully sounds he doesn't like, like he hot dogs. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, um, I like that he's 26, so it's, you know, very little assembly required. Mm-hmm. He's got to adjust to North American ice, but, like... Right. But if he takes things personally, it. then, yeah, he's in the wrong market. Well, there's a difference between being hard on yourself and taking things personally. So I'm going to hope that taking things personally is not what they meant. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and we'll see. We'll see what happens, guys. Like, I think it's just... It's good to add talent. It's good to have this conversation. And it's nice to talk about bloody hockey. Now, we do have to move on yes. to the next subject, okay? Sure. So the next subject is Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment confirmed by the Ontario government, have been in contact with the Ontario government about being one of the host cities for the NHL. Now, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has already said that any player crossing the border, even for work, is going to have to go through two weeks of quarantine. Those are the rules. Yep. So if, let's say, the entire Atlantic division crosses the border to hang out in Toronto and play games here, every single one of them is going to have to sit in a hotel room for two straight weeks in a city that is opening up. I don't know if you know this about Toronto, but mm-hmm. May and June are fabulous months to be here. And it's going to be really, really hard to pull off. Weird May so far. Weird, yeah. But, like, you know, <laughs> like, that's the thing. May is the hopeful month. May is, like, Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. You know, for June is, like, Friday. Um, you can feel some. And I'm just thinking, you know, I'm looking at this. And I, I think, first off, I do think Toronto is a perfect city for it. You need for a hub city to be a hub city in this particular situation. Montreal would be great, too. But you, um, you can't have a non, I don't think you can have a non-playoff hub city. I just don't know if that makes sense. Um, you know, I some Habs fans would argue that they're still in the playoff hunt. They're not. Um, but uh, if Montreal was in the playoffs, I would imagine that that would be part of it too. And I wonder if MLSE has offered to share some of the costs or something there. I mean, there's got to be, it's interesting that Toronto stepped up so quickly, but I guess it shouldn't be surprising. The other city, and Ryan Rashog reported this, is Edmonton. Uh, now, they would obviously probably host their division. I was actually hoping that Toronto would be the only hub city, and that way Edmonton and Calgary would have to play all their playoff games here. <laughs> but uh, Edmonton and the province apparently have had made some progress, according to Ryan Rashog today. Um, Ryan Rashog of TSN, that is. Um, so there Free is... Letter. Best network. Letter. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, garbage. <laughs> so uh, we do know that both... Both places are talking. There are no announcements yet. Um, I, I, here's the thing, guys. You know what I hate? So let's, let's say the playoffs start. Ryan Rashog? No, I don't hate Ryan Rashog. Oh, I don't hate Ryan I don't know Ryan Rashog. I'm sure he's a great guy. Um, here's what I want to know. Okay? So here's, here's what happens. Okay? So the Leafs play um, Tampa Bay in the first round, for instance. Let's say the playoffs start. Sure. Okay. And so if the playoffs started today, Okay, based on what the standings were exactly when the season ended. I just want to look up the standings right now. Because mm-hmm. here's what I want. I want, to, I want to throw something at you. Because Boston is miles ahead of even Tampa. You know, they're eight points, 
Tampa was making a hard push, but Tampa, you know, it's tough to make up eight points in the NHL. Right. Boston right now, if the playoffs started today and we didn't even out or roll it back to 60, uh, 68 games or whatever, Columbus and Boston would be playing, which almost seems unfair. Columbus is scrapping, but that seems unfair. Now, if the Leafs, whether or not the Leafs make it through Tampa, mm-hmm. there's a fairly good chance that Brad Marchand gets to win another playoff round on Toronto Maple Leaf ice. <laughs> that's, where <he's laughs> going. that's where I'm going. Oh, and you, God. Know, you know exactly how he's going to handle that. He's going to... There's going to be no one there. He's great. He's great <laughs> oh, on, <laughs> on that ice surface, Scotiabank Arena, or when it was he called is. the Air Canada Center. Who scored the game winner of the World Cup? World Brad Cup of Marchand. hockey. Brad I was Marchand. a big Brad Marchand fan for a while. <laughs> yeah, for like two weeks. Yeah. And then we said, screw you. No, I am a big fan. I just hate it when he plays the Leafs, man. He's amazing. Sure. So I, I, I'm, just, I'm just asking you guys personally, are you prepared for Brad Marchand, even in an empty arena, to win another damn playoff series on Toronto Maple Leafs home ice. That's the thing about Brad Marchand, man. It doesn't matter if you're prepared or not. He just kind of does it. <laughs> so, uh, no, I am not. Not that it matters. But, I mean, it's the NHL. Ridiculous garbage happens. Yes. I mean, you think of how ridiculously hard the Bruins have been to beat. Um, they lost a first-round playoff series in 2017 to the Sens. Wow, really? Six. What? When the Sens went to the <laughs> I third. I don't remember round, that. Yeah, that was like Austin the... was the team they beat. and they made... That was the wow. ridiculous Carlson, Carlson to flip Hoppen. pass. Oh, to that, that, happened that was that against series. the Bruins. Wow. I think it was in Boston. Wow. So anything can happen. Like, <laughs> the, the idea that the Bruins are this – unbeatable behemoth is strictly a toronto thing oh yeah yeah without question it's, it's they're our good boogeyman. they're very good but yeah they're our boogeyman they're beatable so who knows they play who is it you said in the first round columbus, columbus? and I Torch, mean, columbus. Torch is gonna choke them on defense or at least he's gonna try and Jonas corpus Salas had a great year had signed that extension wasn't seth jones out for the whole season and now maybe he'll be back yes Come back yeah yeah and they did it to Tampa last year, so why not Boston this year? Because here's the thing about the NHL and, and hockey, and this is why it's so chaotic and awesome. You get a team that's confident enough in itself to go, like, or dumb enough to think, yeah, we could take these guys, and sometimes they do. And, and it's, it's just, there's no, they have no business being there, but it happens. You know, and that's, that's Columbus last year against Tampa uh, in a nutshell. However, they're down a few guns. Yep. You don't have Panarin. You don't have Duchesne. I mean, you don't even have Dizin. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing. And Tuka Rask, for as much as Bostonians seem to hate the guy, I don't understand it, uh, has been phenomenal in the playoffs the last three seasons. Or in the last two seasons, I guess, since that elimination to Ottawa in the first round. And even then, he wasn't that bad. Yeah. And I mean, before that, he had a couple of Vesnas. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, but we had another this lost year. in the cup finals a couple times. Like, <laughs> we should Come be on. so lucky. <laughs> They've been to the cup finals three times in the last 10 years. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> no. Literally, no. <laughs> Guys, uh, Jesse, do me a favor. Uh-huh. I've got to pause for two seconds because I have to be so bad. However, can you pull up the draft lottery for the last four seasons? Can you do that for me? All right, like the results or the just results the draft The results of the draft lottery. Can we do that? Okay. Four seasons. I got, a, I got a headline for you, but let me take a peek. Guys, the Red Wings have been screwed. Again. Why Guys, is that? the Red Wings have been screwed. How? After, after making the playoffs for 30 straight years and winning multiple Stanley Cups, don't we feel bad for the Red Wings? Always. Feel so bad for the Red Wings. I'm not My talking about the fans. Point. Talking about the Red Wings. Jim Devolano, VP down there in Detroit, says the Wings were screwed by the draft lottery. And when it comes to conspiracy theories, and I'm going to read you the exact quote because it's a very, very interesting quote. Obviously, uh, if you haven't heard the story yet, we kind of mentioned it in the last episode. But um, with the way the draft lottery will probably work, um, given the fact that the draft will be in season rather than after the season is over and might be at the beginning of June, 
Uh, the NHL has instituted potentially a system where um, Detroit either drafts first or second, and that's the farthest they can fall. Ottawa, can, I think the furthest they could fall was uh, fourth, third or fourth. And then I think Montreal, Florida, a few other places, the, the most they could move up was a couple of spots. Now, Jim DeVolano, under the old, under the old sort of system, Detroit would have like a 20% shot at the top pick. Now it's like 50%, and it's at least top two. And so people said, you know, you guys tanked, and now you've gotten lucky, quote unquote, because of a pandemic. Although it's that's a tough argument to make. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, Come on. Yeah, there's lots know, of words yeah. in the English language. Sure. And let's but, maybe not use that one. But the Red Wings won 17 of 71 games this year. And Jim Damolano said to all the conspiracy theorists out there, to those people who say that, they don't know what they're talking about. We got screwed by the lottery. That's factual. So here's what I want to do. I'm and I didn't look sure. this up Wait, wait, why, wait, 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 wait. Did, he didn't follow that up with an explanation? No. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Now, if you're a Detroit Red Wings fan, you probably already have this answer. But for the other 30 franchise fans, uh, I figured this would be good to take a look at. Detroit has been, for four straight seasons, one of the worst teams in the league. Right? Mm -hmm. So how high have they drafted and have they fallen every single year? Jesse, you starting with 2016, what are we looking at? Where did they draft? And do you have an idea of where they fell from, if they fell at all? Yeah, I got it right up here in front of me. So in 2015-16 uh, season, the Detroit Red Wings finished 15th overall in the league. They did make the playoffs that year. And they drafted in the first round. Do, 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 do. They drafted 20th. Overall, in the first round. Did they? Oh, so that, that was, was from the, year. the Rangers via Arizona. Yes, and they had so that traded, was the Pavel Datsuk deal. Right. Yes, so they and they had it. traded their pick to Arizona, and Arizona ended up taking uh, Jacob Chikrin. So that sounds like a Detroit problem. Yeah, so that was a Detroit. That's a Ken Holland thing. So that's yeah. 2016. Okay, let's, let's again, we're, we're detectives. We're on the search. We're on 16, the case. 17. 16-17, the Red Wings finished 25th overall in the league. And they drafted. So by that logic, they should, they, because there was only 30 teams at the time, they should draft about 5th. Mm -hmm. They drafted ninth. Okay. So they fell. Betsy, why? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, because Water, they lost the lottery. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Screwed. Right. 2018. 17-18, <laughs> okay. Detroit finished 27th. Okay, so they should draft in the top three or four? Uh, they should draft one, two, three, four, fifth, because 31 okay. teams. Oh, there's Vegas now, right, of course. Yes, they should draft fifth, and they drafted sixth. Well, heavens, why? <laughs> they, okay. The lottery balls didn't fall in their favor. Right, right. They drafted sixth, all right. So 18-19, they finished 28th, so they should draft fourth. Mm -hmm. And they ended up drafting sixth. They fell two spots. Gorsh. And this year, they ended up in last place, so they should draft first. There you Guys, go. Those are the results. Now, that, except for that one year where they fell four spots, fifth to ninth is tough, but there's still lots of superstar potential available at that time. You can, you can look at, you know, like, like what – remember that year Boston had three first-round picks at 12, 13, and 14, mm -hmm. and they missed, like, Matt Barzell and uh, – and uh, Brock – didn't they miss Brock, Brock Besser as well? But they did end up – they ended up with some good picks anyway, or at least one good pick who was in the lineup. Um, does that sound, like, screwed to you? That sounds like in three years they dropped a couple spots. On average, they dropped, like, three spots if you average it out, and that just sounds like lottery balls not falling in here. Let me, let, let me, let you know, me, um, like, I don't I, know. No, I think I'm understanding the language that Jim is speaking. So even though, so we're, we're not fans of the Detroit Red Wings. We don't no. care. So them falling a few spots means nothing to us. Them nope. falling a few, a few spots means everything to them. So the fact that they dropped in 2017, in 2018, mm -hmm. in 2019, that is very significant. And I can absolutely Absolutely, unequivocally understand why Jim Devolano is saying that he was screwed by the draft lottery, he and his Detroit Red Wings. 
However, the conversation we are having is how it appears rigged or it's a little fishy that we're randomly jacking the Red Wings of picking first or second 30%. It seems weirdly fishy that they're doing that this year. Jim Devilano fired back with, we have previously been screwed by this system. Mm-hmm. And then stop talking. But so the it's bank like- would appear to be, we were previously screwed. So here's the NHL making good. Is that what I'm getting there, Jim? So Is that he, what I'm getting there, Jim? So you're saying he's encouraging the, cons- the conspiracy. Yes. He's giving reason to it. We have been screwed for three consecutive years. Mm-hmm. So now we're getting it back. Well, it's kind of like saying I've had my last three cars stolen. So I stole a car. So I yes! screwed you. <laughs> I screwed you I back. Know. You screw us, we're going to screw you right on back. And listen, I don't blame him for saying, well, we got shafted the past three years, so I don't feel bad. Right. Of right. course I don't blame but him. He's trying to dispel to conspiracy. Right. If he said that, I'd be like, that's, that's kind of funny. No, no, I We'd it. say the same thing if it was the Leafs. Sure, yeah, sure. Screw no, you, I don't feel bad. I yeah. don't feel bad. I don't blame him for not feeling bad about the draft and the lottery and how everything's falling into his favor at the moment. However, that is exactly what he's saying. We got shafted the last three drafts, or we dropped in the last three drafts. So the NHL handing this to us for no reason, by the way, none. The NHL handing this to them is fortunate for them. And frankly, odd. If someone can give me a good reason, a logical reason why, forget Detroit, forget Ottawa. Forget any, any, any of the teams. names Just involved. Just say any team. Any team. Teams. Why are they dicking with the draft lottery at all? Well, the season's not done. I know it's not done, actually. Do points percentage. Right. Do points percentage. Well, they're going to finish the season eventually. Yeah, well, they're hell-bent on this weird idea that they're going to have the draft in June. So if you want it to be as fair as possible – With the information you have, which is the current standings, you do the current draft lottery system, do points percentage because it's uneven, the amount of games that they've played, and just leave it be. The fact that you're randomly jacking one team's odds of winning by 30%, I'm sorry, is slightly alarming. And you can't tell me that there wouldn't be a diaper crisis in North America if this was happening to the Leafs. Can you imagine if the Leafs had a chance at the first overall pick and their chances were tanked by this much? Or... Opposite. The opposite. Imagine it's 2015. There's There's a pandemic in 2015. And after years of languishing in mediocrity, the Leafs' chances of getting Connor McDavid go from 20 to 50? You don't think a few people would have a handful of questions about that? Or Austin Matthews, even. The Leafs had, at best, a 1 in 5 chance of getting Austin Matthews. And where did he almost go? Where was he one lottery ball away from going? Arizona. Montreal. Oh, Montreal. Not Arizona. Montreal. And we would have had a couple questions, but still, it would have been a one in five chance, and we lost. That's the also, draft lottery. If this was Edmonton right now, the people also would have been up in arms. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> this there's a couple teams. Do right, this no, is, I don't. Yeah. I they were my second team growing up. I don't really think of them. To be honest, it has nothing to do with them. But it is weird that the team with the best chance of winning that happens to be Detroit all of a sudden got their chances of picking first jacked to 50% based on what? Based on best. Based on best. No, worst. 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 (laughs) Based on worst. (laughs) The Detroit worst wings. So, okay. So Jim Tavolano being like, we got screwed the past few years, which is why I don't feel bad, only makes me more suspicious. And it's yet another example 
of an NHL executive talking when they super ought to not. Can I ask, uh, can I ask another thing? And let me just put this forward. And I think Detroit fans will actually agree with this. Now, listen, I'm happy for Detroit fans. If mm-hmm. I'm a Detroit fan, I'm thrilled. I don't give a shit. Ah, screw you guys. I, I got Laugh it. Here. Like, totally, 100%. Got it. Nobody's got it. saying that. But, but, and I think Detroit fans will 1,000% agree with me. Detroit, in my opinion, in the last few drafts where they got quote-unquote screwed, in fact, screwed themselves. Detroit never committed to being one way or the other. They never committed to a full rebuild. They never committed to signing big players. They kept saying, well, I think there was like a little bit of talk. Well, maybe we can convince Tavares. No. The Detroit Red Wings kept signing guys who were mediocre. Mike Green forever and ever. And they kept not doing anything about their positioning. They continued to stay in the same spot. They would sign, you know, uh, we'll, we'll throw some money at Trevor Daly. Why not? What are we and doing? had Detroit under Ken Holland actually committed to a rebuild, this would have been over. They wouldn't have been screwed by the draft lottery because they wouldn't have been able to. If Detroit was as bad as they are now under Stevie Eiserman, because Steve Eiserman is a smart man, he knows he's got to he's, he knows he's got to take the bullet this year and start to build a great team here, and they've got some great prospects in the minors. This this rebuild could have been sped up a year and a half, maybe two years. If they had just been like, you know what, we're coming to the end. We had to offload the Datsu contract in, what is it, 15 or 16? Um, so we don't have our first-round pick, but we're picking 20 if that's not bad. We're going to have a bad couple seasons, and then we're going to come back with some great, young, incredible talent. And instead, they sort of went into this limbo mode, like, no, we're still the, – the Atlantic division's loaded with talent, but we still think we have a shot. You know, that, that's, that was the attitude they had. And I think that – for Jim Devolano to say, oh, we were screwed by the draft. No, you put yourself in position to be screwed by the draft. You put yourself in a position where you had a very little shot at a high draft pick and a very big shot of falling off. You finish 25th, that's what you get. Most teams that finish 25th, 26th end up picking 6, 7, 8, man. That's what happens. And by the way, that's the way a lottery works. If I were to buy a lottery ticket today, and I lose. Do I call the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation and say, hey, guys, you screwed me because I didn't win? I just Could. learned today that that's how you're supposed to do it. That's, that's <laughs> not how a lottery works. That's not how a lottery works. A lottery works with a ball falling in to a hole and going down a little tube and then landing at random. That is how a lottery works. If you want to stack the odds in your favor, do what Detroit did this year and win 17 of 71. That's how you do it. And for four years, or three and a half years under Ken Holland, although you could see the end coming, they didn't do anything about it, and they kept Ken Holland. And the teams, the, 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 you, you know the fans were going nuts. You know the fans knew what they needed to do. But Jim De, for Jim Devolano to say, oh, we got screwed. No, man, you did this to you. You gave yourself a 5% shot at the number one overall pick and a 20% shot to move back to number nine. It's percentages. What did you think was going to happen? They're numbers. You're a numbers person. You the, should know that. What did he think was going to happen? Exactly what he wanted to happen, which mm-hmm. is every yeah. rich guy's response to everything, it seems. Yeah. And I think uh, all of this was evident in 2015, 16, when they held on for every last morsel just to make the playoffs in eighth yes. place. Why? Like, they didn't need to finish it. They could have t- torn it down in that – 15, 16, that 15 off season. And now five years later, you would have been five years ahead of where you should have been. And, and you couldn't that, tank then. To that point, Jesse, and I would love to do this. If, if, you, if one of you doesn't mind looking this up right now. Sure. What's what was, if, if you committed to a rebuild when they should have, which is when Mike Babcock left, right? Because they just clawed their way in and Gus Nyquist went on a roll. and it was 2015. It yeah. was crazy, right? That was 2015. 15, 16. Why did they need to trade the Datsuk year? Why couldn't they, if they committed to a rebuild, and they could have eaten it. They could have eaten that. They could have had, well, I mean, they could have had Jacob Chikrin, maybe not the guy they would have wanted, maybe not the guy they would have picked. Why did they have to trade one year of Pavel Daxut's ghost contract to Arizona? Why would you have to do that? And this is the, this is the point. You screwed yourself, Detroit. And this is not the fans, this is the management. This is the Red Wings. 
The Red yeah, Wings they, screwed themselves. Like I'm looking at I'm looking at the players they've drafted from the 2015 draft. Only one player has played in the NHL so far, and that's what? Evgeny that's Evgeny Svechnikov, and that's the second best Svechnikov. Hold on, what about Zadina? <laughs> uh no he's he was played. a f- he was 2018 no sorry not since this is oh, just sorry. sorry can sorry. you imagine okay I was like, oh they'd be way worse um 2016 they've had three players play uh philip heronic who is good good player yeah. yeah good defenseman like him dennis Cholosky, who's a strange player sort of following the winged wheel podcast the the red wings yo-yo him way too much Right. Um, but he's a first round pick has potential and uh, Giovanni Smith, who I want to say had his first career goal against the Leafs, but three points in 21 games. So they were really, he's a second round pick, but he was one of those guys who was sort of thrust into a terrible lineup when they were really digging deep 2017, which is pretty recent to be fair. They picked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 guys, which is a lot of guys. Um, they've uh, two of them have played. And they've gotten 19 points combined out of them, 18 in 62 games from Michael Rasmussen, and one point in 16 games from Gustav Lindstrom. Zadina, another guy who up and down, up and down, and obviously 2019 they guarded those guys very close to the chest. Sure, so. and, and that was the right thing to do. But that's mm-hmm. Eiserman taking over. Mm-hmm. The, the problem for me here is – when you look at the history, and again, this is all far gone. This is a Ken Holland administration, and I know that he had significant amount of leash because of the, the success they'd had in the past. But I cannot, after seven years on this podcast, this is our seventh season, believe that the Leafs are talking about – Leafs literally came in and lifted Detroit's idea. We're going to have a top-down organization all the yep. way through. That's yep. what Detroit had when we and started they, the show. And, they abandoned and now, it. now it's completely the opposite. The De- Detroit is like the Leafs kind of languishing, like, I don't know what we are or where we're going. No, Not under really Eisenman, anymore. I, no, no, I, under I, Eisenman, I, yes. Yeah. But again, we're, we're going back to Devilano's comments, and Devilano's been there the whole time. Yeah. He's yeah. a long-time executive. Can I lay out the Datsuk trade for you? Please do. Sure. And then I want to know who Detroit signed that summer after Datsuk was traded. Or the Go summer ahead. before. Right. Yeah. So it's the going into the 15-16 season, they're still on that. 30 year run or whatever it is. Yeah. Of playoff Very period. long time. 25. They, I want to say they play the 15, 16 season. They squeak out fifth, uh, eighth seed in the, in the East. They make it 15th seed in the league. They drop out in the first round. They go into night one of the draft. They have Datsu's contract on the books for $7.5 million, just dead Oops. money. They trade down from 16 to 20. Mm-hmm. So they give Arizona that, uh, 7.5 million cap hit and they trade down four spots and then they also get the 53rd pick okay that's because, not a bad man trade. that is they super first, yeah. inexpensive that's they get the bad. 20th pick and the 53rd pick but then the 16th pick that arizona takes ends up being uh jacob chikrin chikrin and then uh the 20th pick is dennis chalowski who has not quite developed into chalowski he's he's a defenseman though so like who knows but like looking at the 2016 draft yeah, I was, I mean, I was that looking is the at risk other players you take when you trade down, right? If your guy, if you think right. that's your guy, yeah, that's the risk you take. You can't fault him for that. I was looking at, I was looking at guys they missed out on from 2016. I'm looking at the 10 picks after Chalosky. I'm like, ah, there's no one who really stands out. The second round, god damn it, everyone, every single one passed the on hits? Alex DeBrincat at least once. Wow, it so makes me How did crazy. The, ah, it, Even at the was time, everybody the was time. like, strap this man. <laughs> we knew forever. We knew forever it was a bad idea, and they did it anyway. Everybody, yeah. not just Detroit. Uh, mm-hmm. Toronto, man. Leafs Toronto. twice. Leafs yeah. twice. It's crazy when everybody is saying a thing, and then it happens. You know, Maybe you yeah. should listen to everybody's idea. Yeah. I remember that was Subban. <laughs> I remember that was Subban, too. Yeah. He was this yeah. guy who everyone knew was going to be good. Mm-hmm. let's take him in the second round anyway. And he was awesome. Although I will say uh, Igor Korshkov has a higher goals per game than Alex Brinkat and points per game. <laughs> one goal, one game. Boom. Oh. Well, that, that settles it. Nail in the coffin. Sorry to Brinkat. Go home. Should have never got rid of Mark <laughs> Hunter, like I've been saying the whole time. <laughs> Should have never got rid of him. Oof. No, I, I just – and and what's great is I don't actually think we're going to get much pushback from Detroit fans because if we talk about they've kind of drafted bad, they'll be like, yeah, we know. But who did they sign that summer? Why did they need to clear that spot? Right. 
That's what I want to know. I'll I'll pull it up. You know what what does Detroit's roster look like in the 16 17 season? Yeah, here you you look on uh, cap friendly there Jesse. I'm looking on NHL trade tracker to see if they made any acquisitions. When when was this? Summer 16 20- 17. Yeah, summer 16. Summer 16. So at the draft there was Oh, here, oh I got one. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas Vanek was signed up. <laughs> Ooh. Oh my God! Really? That's Zetterberg's last season. For cheap though, two point six million. What are you doing? Right. What are you doing? What are you doing? Franz Nielsen six year deal thirty one point five million. That summer? That summer? No, that was, that was the, the bad same. summer. That, that was, was the, the bad summer. summer. That was the bad summer. That was the bad summer for. That everybody. was the Andrew Ladd, Nielsen. Who else was signed that? Darren summer? Helm, Louis Erickson, I think, million for Lucic. five years. Why was Darren Helm signed for five years? Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to confirm, Jesse. I'm sorry. These are all Red Wings. Nielsen and Helm were the same summer as Datsuk and Vanek. Yes, they were going for a 31. Like they Steve thought they had Ott. a team. Steve Ott, one year deal, league men. Uh, Big men. Yeah, yeah, but you just Anything spent ten million dollars like, on Helm and, and Nielsen. Right. Yeah. There's, Anything there's under one point five, I'm not gonna jump over too much. But Nielsen, yeah. what the? F- what? Yeah, that's what you trade Datsuk to do. You're, they're still going for it, which is ridiculous. But they clearly like you have Zetterberg, who was still the team leading scorer at the end of that season, at sixty eight points. But like the next closest was Gus Nyquist. You know, and I maybe they thought, and I think a lot of people did, like, whoa, is this a you know a superstar in the making? right? Is this, is this the guy? And not to make uh, everything about Babcock, but it's, I sort of got the impression just listening to them talk. Like I kind of wonder if Datsuk or Zetterberg would have stuck around like mm-hmm. for maybe the one extra season. Let me look at um, Pavel Datsuk by the way, because uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this, that dude still plays hockey, eh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's playing for actually. Uh, I think we might have briefly mentioned this. Uh, he's playing for Yekaterinburg Avdimobilist. I don't um, blame him for for going. By the way, he wanted to spend time with his daughter. All right. Yeah. Like, of course. D- Datsuk was the second leading scoring center on Avdimobilist behind Peter Holland. Wow. Also, <laughs> Peter a, Holland outscored Datsuk. A Toronto the signing KHL. in the summer of 2016. Summer hey. 2016, Toronto signed Peter Holland. There you go. Hey, there one you year, go. One year, 1.3 million. There you go. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. That was also the same summer they gave uh, Peter Mrazek a new contract. They signed it for two years, 8 million. That's Detroit. Detroit, yeah, yeah. Mrazek was... wasn't bad. He wasn't bad. I think they thought Mrazek they had a good better. He was a very weird. He's a strange goalie. Yeah. If you ask me any given night what to expect out of P- Peter Mrazek, I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't know. He might be unbeatable. He might allow 10, like we saw. <laughs> I think that's you know the problem, mean? right? Uh, like, last, last year with the Hurricanes, you know, amazing numbers. 914 save percentage, 239 when he, go, when he, when he leaves. Um, but then, you know, the year before, he is a .91 uh, – sorry, .891 with the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, like, you know, when they, who I believe acquired him at the trade deadline, he, you know, he's just, he's an up and down sort of guy. You know, if you look at his career save percentages, 918, 921, 901, 910, 891, 914, 905. Like there's a lot of swaying back and forth and goaltending is a funny position anyway, but that's a lot. It was, a, it was a lot. Here's the thing. It seemed a little bit like at that point, And again, I can understand if you look at the roster, you can see how that team could squeak in. But there's no way in hell, if you look at that roster from 16, 17, that they have a chance in hell. It's Zetterberg's last year. They're going for the playoffs. Like, why? Yeah. Why? You know, you could, you could say, well, we want to honor Henrik Zetterberg by throwing away a season that you could be developing. Sure. No, but, yeah. like, you're, you're there to make the hard decisions. That would have been a hard decision. But yes. the obvious one. You're there to make the – you're there to do what the Rangers did. And I've praised this from the day they did it. They pulled the shoot. Mm-hmm. The Leafs kind of pulled the shoot when they fired uh, Randy Carlisle. At what, point does, at what point does Chicago get on this end? Oh, dude, like, Chicago's here. This is uh, Detroit and Chicago. Chicago yeah. now is Detroit in 1718. They were eh, – eh, Chicago's sort of coming out of it. They've done, they've done a lot of stuff I really hate, but they've still drafted all right. They have mm-hmm. some good young pieces. Their stars are better Adam's than Detroit's not stars. It. 
There's <laughs> Chicago stars now are better than Detroit stars were at the end of all this. Agree. I agree. Agree. Right? They're, so they're trying to do 100%. a rebuild on the fly, and it's yeah. kind of working. Yeah. As we call it, in, as we as we like to say at Bell, because this is a thing that you know corporations always have those buzz things that go on. Building a plane while flying it. <laughs> building a plane mid-flight. Man, you know what though? So, and now we're completely off topic, but I'm just looking at the uh, 1998 draft when Pavel Datsuk was drafted. Okay. And. It's, it's a great example of where scouting has come from mm -hmm. since then. 1998, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but it was also 22 years ago, so maybe it was. Uh, Pavel Datsuk is third in scoring from the 1998 draft. He was picked in the sixth round. If you look at other guys picked in, like, the later rounds, the next highest scoring guy outside of the first three rounds was Andre Markov in the sixth round. So there's another oh. Russian... The league completely missed entirely. Eighth round, Michael Ryder. So there's a Canadian. Fifth round, Yaroslav Spachek. Fifth round, Michael Samuelson. Fourth round, Alexei Ponikarovsky. There's a guy. Sixth round, Alex Kotelik. Like, it just, it just seemed like Europe and Russia were not scouted well at all at the time, which is wild because Sweden, Finland, the Czech Republic, Russia, they've been hockey powerhouses for a lot longer than 22 years. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like, I don't know, no one really scouted it. Nope. It's true. Or they yeah, did it weird. poorly. Yeah, they did. They did. Actually, that was one of the things that gave the Blue Jays an edge um, in, uh, in the late 80s. I think it was, it was it, Jesse, was it Puerto Rico or Cuba that they, they had scouts in that like the no Dominican Italy. Republic? Dominican, yes. Yeah. And was, that's where Robbie Alomar was found, right? Yeah. yeah. So they had like no other team went to the Dominican. Mm -hmm. And so the they, Jays did, and they and found. They, yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, and they found the best second baseman ever, like, or one of the best second baseman to ever play the game, just because they sent a scout there on a plane. And they tried to recreate that philosophy with uh, Vladdy, and I think AA did. He did his due diligence, and he went down there, and they got him. So they got him. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Did they? Did they? Um, like they didn't draft him. They just baseball's weird, him man. As a mm -hmm. boy, yeah, like, he was like sixteen. Teenager. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, doing that to adjust the white balance. This kid hits stingers. Like, that's, that was it. <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of like they have similar rules to soccer, where you just sign children. Wasn't Wayne yeah. Rooney, like, <laughs> in pajamas? Like, <laughs> how old was that guy? He was, like, 18 when he started playing. When was he signed? Yeah, most guys are 17 or 18 when they start, but they have, like, like I know there's a guy for TFC that was a part of, I think it was Real Madrid's program from the time he was, like, eight years old. Like, yeah. <laughs> they, get, they get pulled in and now and like the thing is is that those kids can 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 either stay in those programs or they can like fall out maybe they physically don't develop maybe they get injured um so it's a pretty vicious like it's a tough process uh but there are a lot of teams with guys like kids kids teams i think um tfc even has a young tfc they yeah they're the most of those the big soccer clubs they run like uh i don't know call them camps Academies. On a, academy, there's the word, yes. Academy. So they just run their own mini soccer academy and you groom the next generation of talent for your team. You look at it that way and then if the parents want to take them out, put them wherever. But you figure if somebody's going to be a star, you're on them when they're a child. Mm -hmm. And then if they're in the system, they're going to want to sign with you. You give them everything in the world. And hopefully if they grow up to be a superstar, they'll want to play for your team. My brother-in-law was, uh, I think he practiced with the TFC Academy a few times. Well, that's cool. I wish he made it. Gosh darn it. Yeah, it would have been neat. He see, he won with he won an SFL title in Scotland with one of Ross County's academy teams. Whoa. That's cool. Yeah, that's or minor right. minor league teams. I think it was above academy. Yeah, it's cool, right? Like yeah. to just say that. Like I've seen the medal well, and I'm like, ah. it's it's cool in England because the setup is like there's the EPL and there's like four leagues under it. And the guys who are four leagues under it are just like normal dudes who have normal jobs and they make like ten grand and they just play. And like that's if you look up if if you're not a huge soccer fan, Jamie Vardy's story, right? He's one of the most prolific scorers of the last five years, and was just a fourth league player. And they were like, "Oh, hey, this guy's pretty good." <laughs> and they brought him up, and they had like this ridiculous championship run that I think they gave it like it would happen once every 100 years. I forget what was the team. Was that Leicester? Leicester. That's right. Leicester City found him. And it's just, it's just a wild, Jamie Vardy's just got this crazy story. And, like, he's a British national team striker. And he was playing, league, like, fourth league. 
So anyway, it's kind of neat. Yeah. Did so, Leicester uh, City not fire their manager like a year or two years after? Probably. They did probably. the most improbable run in like pro sports history. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think like a year later he was fired. Something yeah. like that. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. I'm just preparing for the chat to lose their mind over the cat that just walked by your window. I know, I know. That's William, <laughs> by the way. He's uh, oh, oh he, I, my favorite comment from last video was, "If a pure later truck pulls into his backyard, I'm going to lose my mind." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not my backyard. That's my neighbor's backyard. This is oh, the side okay. Of my house, so oh, okay, I don't have a backyard uh, except for like that's where my cars are parked and people just hang out like randomly. In the yeah, where people chill, episode. chill yeah, by your car. Hang on, there's someone in my backyard. <laughs> Yeah. Um, lastly, and this is a quicker conversation because we are running a little short on time, but you are Pittsburgh. Guys, you're Pittsburgh. Yes. I win yes. all the time. Yes. yes. You have yes. great players. But here's the question. You got a goaltending controversy going. I don't know if you know this or not, but you've got a 25-year-old goalie who's an upstart uh, who is playing really, really well. His name's Tristan Jari. Mm -hmm. 921 save percentage for what it's worth 243 goals goals against average he went 20 12 and 1 so far this season then you got two times stanley cup winner matt murray two times stanley cup winner the guy won the cup before he'd ever played a full season in the nhl okay he was a two-time stanley cup winner at the end of his rookie season yes well yeah yeah that's <laughs> right and i didn't he win a con smith in there too no um, no. no, I don't know. No, but no, anyway, no he was no, very good. That, no. He was good. very, very good. You got Matt Murray, who was also 20, 11, and 5. Not bad. However, 287 goals against average for what it means. There's an asterisk next to that stat, but it's still an important one. Sure. 899 save percentage. Both are restricted free agents at the end of this season. Now, Matt Murray had one down year by Matt Murray standards in 17, 18 where he posted a 907, which is still not bad in 49 games. Last year, right back up into Matt Murray territory. 919 save percentage. That's what you hope for from your start, right? Even if his goals against average was a little high at 269. My question to you is Pittsburgh, like Toronto, right up against the cap at all times. And they have been for years. And they've made it work. Do you, if you're Pittsburgh, say, well, I could trade the valuable goalie because you know there's going to be a lot of teams in on Matt Murray, and we take a chance on this Christian Jari guy, and then we sign you know, Matt Murray to a mega bucks deal, which they have to do. Excuse me. Let me start that again. Okay. I, 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 I basically went over my – I went the wrong way. So do you, you, do, you, do you take your chance on the young guy who is young, upstart, 25 years old, just coming into his own? You don't have to pay him all that much. And then trade the veteran guy who's won a couple Stanley Cups and, you know, potentially has more value in the trade scenario. Or do you keep the guy that's won the Cups despite the fact that he's had a bit of an offseason and trade the young guy who is definitely on the way up and who someone might take a chance at but is probably not worth as much? If you're Pittsburgh and you need to add value because if you're against the cap, you always need to add value through trade, what solution do you come to? That's what they're facing at the end of the season. Ooh, ooh. So I was going to say you try your damnedest to keep both because what we're discovering more and more is you need yeah. two goalies. Yeah. You need two goalies in this league. You do. Um, but I'm looking at Pittsburgh, and their pickle expands far beyond their goaltending. So what do you say? So Matt Murray, like you said, restricted free agent, 3.75. Tristan Jari is making actual league minimum, 6.75. Both restricted free agents. Then there's Yuso Rikala, who is a restricted free agent. Justin Schultz is an unrestricted free agent at 5.5. And he, he's a right shot defenseman, is he not? Yep, that's, that is primary pickle numero uno. Uh, Patrick Marlowe, 700 grand, he's gone. Dominic Simone. Uh, RFA making 750 grand. What kind of season did Dominic Simone have? Okay, not as good as I thought, but still decent enough. 22 points in 64 games. He strikes me as one of those guys who, you know, you throw into the Sidney Crosby of Guinea Malkin lottery. Here's your cookies. Here you go. You get that. Um, Dominic Simone, Sam Lafferty, Anthony Angelo, 
you know, nah, not too worried about that. Here's a name I'm worried about though, because I love this guy in a Pittsburgh Penguin uniform. And I'm sure a lot of Penguins fans would agree. 14 goals, 21 assists, 35 points in 66 games this season. And he got hot. Jared McCann. Second time he's been brought up on this show. So he's pickle number two. I would say behind Justin Schultz. Evan Rodriguez, I'm not as concerned about. And Connor Sheary, three million bucks UFA. That sort of strikes me as the sort of thing where maybe you just have to let him go. So Pittsburgh's got some difficult decisions to make. I think it'd be awesome if they were able to keep both goalies. I'm not totally certain that's going to be able to happen. Now, I have less than 100 games experience as an NHL goalie. I just signed a deal for $4.4 million before um, all this pandemic broke out. Uh, when was when was the signing? Ju- July 13th. So when I signed this $4.4 million deal for two years, I had played – and he played 50. I'd played like 35 NHL games. When did he sign it? Uh, this past summer. Who is this? Jordan Bennington. Uh, oh. Well, he did win a cup. Yeah. yeah. He Stanley did win a cup. In his ear. So he, his contract is fascinating to me if I'm an Edmonton Oilers fan. Because, there. I mean, there's Matt Murray who – obviously won two cups. He's played far more games, but he's already signed his thank you for winning us a cup deal. And we all thought he was going to get a big old raise. He was going to be one of the best goalies in the league and it's just not happening. But if you're Tr- Tristan Jari, you've had Did you one... mean to say Edmonton Oilers? Did I say Oilers? You said Oilers. Yeah. yeah and that's why I'm, I'm I was wondering where I was going. <laughs> oh, that's weird. Pittsburgh why did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> why did I say that? I don't know Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Maybe I was looking at Justin Schultz. I don't know. I don't okay. know. Anyway, so if I'm Matt Murray, uh, you know, I can't ask for one of the best goalies in the league money. So that goes in Pittsburgh's favor. Like, can he ask for a raise? Oh, Matt Murray? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And he's coming off a do- – uh, he can ask for it. But he's coming it. off a dog shit season. Steve, he'll get it from someone. From someone. This is the problem, though. He's a restricted free agent. So Pittsburgh still has him like this. Mm-hmm. Tristan Jari is a fascinating one because he's got just the one good season, right? So there might be a scenario where I guess it just depends how much of a sweet talker uh, Jim Rutherford is because there could be a scenario where you keep both. It's just going to be extremely difficult. And I'm looking at the uh, Penguins long-term injury reserve. They got Jake Gensel there. So the salary cap that I'm seeing here, um, they're using up a ton of LTIR. Didn't they just get Jason Zucker too? They just got Jason Zucker who has three seasons left at th- three seasons left at 5.5. Oh, to be the Pittsburgh Penguins though. Like it, this is the type of problem you strive to have. Right. So you, my question remains though, can what I, direction do you go? Can I answer it? <laughs> you go ahead. Okay. You go ahead while I try to actually answer Adam's thing. I I am going to Go to our history buff, Adam Wilde. Uh-oh. And I'm going to ask you a question to answer this question. Okay. Uh, complete this phrase. The best predictor of future performance is... Past success. Past success. The Pittsburgh Penguins have shown past success in getting rid of their Stanley Cup winning goaltender who's been there for a little bit and going... With Actually, the- they paid a first to get rid of him, too. <laughs> To get rid this of time, Murray. I think they'll yeah. be collecting a first for it. A second. And it was a second. Oh, it was a oh, second? second? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. But still. <laughs> and going with the younger, unproven goalie. It, in the case of Matt Murray, he had already won a Stanley Cup, but Jari's already proven that he can win. So I think Pittsburgh will follow the Pittsburgh Penguin model and just go with Justin Jari. Here's, here's the thing, though, about your, your younger thing. Tristan Jari is one month younger no sorry one month older than matt murray right but at a different development curve right yes yes younger in the sense that he's gonna command less money and that he seems to have a longer uh prime in front of him extremely important wrinkle in all of this uh 
in one season I played 14 games, threw up a 921. The next season I played 36 games, threw up a 916. Not as good, but I played more games and still very good. Casey DeSmith, who is signed to the Pittsburgh Penguins for this season and the next two after at, uh, what is it, 1.25? So you're saying they have three good goalies. (laughs) Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. So they're making a move. Right. Do you trade, Steve? Yeah. Well, oh, man. Because you get more value from Matt Murray, but you also have to pay him more if you keep I don't know that you do. I think you do. I think you do. I think you, you call the teams that can't get goaltending. Oh, teams love the mystery box, though. They do. And Tristan Jari's the mystery box. He It's his first good – it's his first productive NHL season, and he's an all-star. Mm-hmm. Man, you know, Tristan you, Jari could be anything. He could even be Matt Murray. Teams love the mystery box. <laughs> they you know, love it. If I am the Ottawa Senators, I'm calling and asking, what, what do you want from Matt Murray? Yeah, it free. That's a yes. fun name. Oh, because they have a big old bunch of picks? But big old bunch of picks, which Pittsburgh could use, even if they parlay those into other players at the trade deadline or whatever you want to say. Ottawa has a gigantic position to fill when Craig Anderson leaves. I don't know if that's the end of this season. I don't know what happens. But I think we've kind of seen the end, right? Yes. And I think if I'm Ottawa, there is a guy who is a restricted free agent I can pay him what he wants because, like, I don't know, like, who's, who's, who's getting paid on the Ottawa Senators, right? And then you have your goaltending position set up. You sign him to a five-year contract, somewhat similar to what Freddie signed. Five years, $25 million. Who hates that? How he's old is Matt Murray? Cups. 25. 25. Oh, wow. Like, 25. he's 25 he's about years to... old. This guy is wow. perfect for a rebuilding team. Perfect. He, oh. And he's won in the playoffs. He's played with Sidney Crosby. This is a guy – that I think if you're a young upstart team, like the Senators will be, inevitably, even Detroit. You know, if you're Detroit, why aren't you making that phone call, right? Can I throw something out there? Sure. Uh, Who's going to get more money in their next deal? Matt Murray or Frederick Anderson? Freddie Anderson. Freddie. Yeah. So, well, what about the Which I think is, by the way, a mistake. What about the least? Oh, tra- it's a mistake. I'm just saying what's going on. What about happen. the least trade away Freddie Anderson and sign Matt For Murray? Matt Murray? <laughs> <laughs> well, Dubas would love that. Buddy, he's oh he's, he's, got he's a, a tough former, decision. Former Sue Greyhound. I mean, you'd probably super piss off uh friggin' Austin Matthews in the process because those two are best friends. Mm-hmm. Guys. Yeah, but Freddie's not coming I, back after next I year. don't think he is. Yeah. I don't so why not is. get Matt Murray ahead of time? Yeah. Trade away Freddie. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Uh, Matt Murray's about to turn 26. So Tristan Jari is actually a year younger. Okay. Well, no. it, it, again, we're talking about the difference of one ne- month or 11 months. Ne- it doesn't ne- matter. Ne- it's ne- not ne- a huge thing. The point is, the point is that we are looking at a goaltending situation, much like New York, where something's got, someone's got to go. Someone's got to retire in New York's case. Uh, <laughs> no, like Henrik's needs to re- retire. If you're, if you can get Henrik to retire he might. or go on LTIR, then you can keep both goalies in your set, and which is, which is what New York should do. Your controversy was just, hey, one guy go away. Yeah. <laughs> if you're Pittsburgh and you've got the opportunity here, I mean, maybe you're able to hang on to Matt Murray, but if you're not, you've got some pretty good value in the trade market, especially with some of these young upstart teams. Think about what the first overall pick and Matt Murray does to a franchise like Detroit or a franchise like Ottawa. That is a game-changing situation. And if, as long as you have approval from ownership, which is tough in terms of in, in Ottawa's case, give him twenty five million bucks. Is he going to say no? God, what he, we, like I'm just looking at Matt Murray's or, or maybe career. it's four, maybe it's six million a season. Who cares? You don't know what to expect from him season in season out. And the reason Matt Murray's name carries so much weight, this dude came in. In a 13 game season and a 49 game season, threw up a 930 and a 923. Mm-hmm. And that's just in the regular season. Pittsburgh's first cup run, he was a 923 in 21 games. The next season w- that he split with uh, Flurry, he was a, in 11 games in the Stanley Cup playoffs. This dude threw up a 937. Followed that up that's with a absurd. 907. 
He th- followed it up with a 907 regular season, 908 playoff. Yeah. Uh, follows that up with a 919 season in 50 games, which is spectacular. Mm-hmm. 906 playoff. In this season, he's an 899. I think you know what I don't to know expect from Matt Murray. Yes, you do. Steve, no, you I just don't. went through them. 930, 923, 907, 919, and an 899. Even with that 899, his save percentage is a 914 is in, in his entire yeah. career. You know exactly what to expect from Matt Murray. Matt Murray is a starting goaltender in the NHL. And if you can get a 914 yeah. from Matt Murray, pretty damn good chance that your team's in the playoffs. Yeah. He's a goalie who's going to help you win. And if you get those two playoff games and all that gate revenue and all that local TV revenue and all that stuff, he's paid his contract. Those did two he, home playoff games, it's all you need. Did he battle – I want to say he battled an injury because, like, just looking yeah. at it, he struggled the second Marc-Andre Fleury left, and that makes sense. His role changes dramatically. You can't lean on him as hard. And then he throws up a spectacular season, and this one was so weird. I mean, you sort of – he's played 199 – NHL games, Tristan Jari is sitting at 62. Like, that's got to be a giant tiebreaker, not even mentioning all the playoff experience in the Cups. Well, but also, Matt Murray, when they moved on from Marc-Andre Fleury, had played even less games. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're... Mm-hmm. Here's, here's one. Yeah, and he played his rookie year, man. Here's one. What do they want? Like, what, do, what would Matt Murray prefer he'd probably want to stay at the place where he's built a life and built a place with Sidney Crosby wants to make a lot of money wants to make a lot of money true but like Tristan Jari you're just making the league you have a chance to go somewhere and be the guy the starter I don't Uh, know if that place is necessarily Ottawa yeah but if you flip a second pick to Pittsburgh for Tristan Jari say or whatever it is I don't know what it would be I don't know what the trade market is for goalies this year um, he's still fighting for a number one spot. Matt yeah. Murray is a number one. So if Detroit's looking for value, Matt Murray's the guy you have to trade. I should also mention, by the way, Casey DeSmith, wicked NHL numbers. He was garbage in the AHL this year. Okay. Uh, so it's an interesting one. But again, uh, the problem with Pittsburgh and the problem, you know, it's been with the Leafs and the problem with a few other teams is that they have too many good players. What was you? You know what I mean? It's it's Ooh. the salary cap creates this problem, but it used to be being shit created the problem. <laughs> right? So the penguins are not shit. This is not a problem. It is um more of a conundrum. Right. Decisions must be made. It doesn't really look like you know, the fear is Matt Murray goes somewhere and he succeeds. Oh, we look so stupid. Or Tristan Jari goes somewhere, and he's amazing. And, oh, we look so stupid. That's what happens. Like, that's what happens when you have too many good players in a salary cap era. You've you got to trade them away, and they go somewhere, and they're good. But you only look stupid if you don't play better. Right. If, you, if the Pittsburgh Penguins continue to do what the Penguins have done for over a decade now, which is make the playoffs in, like, minimum second round most years, you're fine. What do you lose? You've got Crosby and Malkin. Latang's not injured, at least not recently. Like, come on, you're okay. Careful, like, careful with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it, it, it only looks bad if you're bad. Like, the Leafs looked bad when they traded X guys, many guys, because they were bad, like Anton Strauman. Gave him away for nothing. Even Scott Harrington, no one talks about that, but we gave away Scott Harrington for nothing when we could have used him. And they looked bad for doing that. Because there was even a time where Richard Ponick made them look bad. And they were so horrible. And so when they go and the team sucks, then you go, why did you give away valuable player? But I have a hard time believing that the Pittsburgh Penguins, if they're able to keep Justin Schultz, especially after, you know, if, you're, if you don't have to sign Matt Murray, I have a hard time believing that they look anything other than a smart team. But the NHL always defaults to, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Um, and I'm a, if that's the case, I think Matt Murray's gone. Frederick Anderson and Alex Kerfoot in exchange for Matt Murray and Jared McCann and every other player who's ever played for the Sioux Greyhounds. <laughs> Tell <laughs> me you don't do that deal. Final offer, even though it adds far more salary to Pittsburgh's roster, I will hear none of it. <laughs> Let's do the press conference, guys. The presser. 
press conference. Press conference, we're doing Adam's History Corner because I teased it last episode. Okay. Let's, can, we, can we hold off on Talleyrand just because I have not had a chance to do the proper research and that guy deserves it. Who's, uh, oh, that, was that your corruption guy? That was, yeah, that was the corruption guy. Ah. And I, I, I just can't. I can't. Ah. I can't do it. Because I want to make sure. That's a guy I want to research a little bit more because he was, he had so many, just give you an idea. Just, just a small story about him. Uh, France backed up uh, the United States in the Revolutionary War. George Washington sends a diplomat to France, uh, or it was Jefferson. I think it was what Washington during the during uh, the French Revolution. Talleyrand, who used to serve the king, is now serving under the new government, and he says to them, "Oh, you want to talk to us? Cool. Uh, you'll have to pay me twenty thousand dollars back then." <laughs> and they're like, That's "No." Ridiculous. So they sent three diplomats. <laughs> Two of them got on boats and went home. And there was this huge diplomatic scandal between the states and France in the 1790s because this guy, basically Talleyrand would just use his position to make a pile of money. And he served under every government from the king who got his head chopped off to the estates general, which was the uh, first parliament, to the uh, uh, Jacobin government under Robespierre where everybody lost their head, to the directory, which was five people and very not democratic and a bunch of just, just <laughs> cynical bad rulers to Bonaparte to after Bonaparte. This guy was unbelievable. So I, I, I want to do a, a bit, bit of a deep. Are you sure you don't want to do it here? Well, that's what it was. I mean, that's, I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant man. It's not what he did though. It's why he did it. And I think we need to get into that. But anyway, that's, that's what I got for you. All right. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant man and hated. <laughs> uh, I'll ask you this one from uh, bear hug the brave on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> Can you give a little background onto who actually discovered America? Not the Native Americans, because history decided that they don't count. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Christopher Columbus and Leaf, Life, am I saying that correctly? Uh, Erickson? That the Viking guy in the 11th century, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Do so, you have any insight on that? Let me just say this it's weird that to say that humanity discovered North America. Uh, in the last several centuries is a joke. Uh, obviously, there were people here for several thousand years, and that happened when there was what, what we speculate was a, a land bridge between Asia and uh, in North America that was during you know, a very cold period uh, where people would have crossed the ice, come down through like the Yukon and Alaska and that sort of thing, and made their way into the North and South American continent. Um, however, we're talking about European exploration, which is what I think he's talking about, which is for so long, oh, the discovery of the Americas. Um, I don't know much about Leif Erikson, but I do know that there were Viking settlements and they found them in Newfoundland uh, and other places where, you know, the Vikings actually, you know, sailed these long boats, which were not that long, maybe 100 feet long, and rode them like across the Atlantic Ocean. And you think about that. In the, you know, 100 years ago or 120 years ago, it took several weeks to get across on a steamer. Like the Titanic was going to take a week at least. You know, so you think about that, right? And, and so how long, you're, you're at sea for months in this tiny little boat. And the fact that anyone survived the journey that they had, they just, they didn't know how many supplies they should bring. They didn't know what kind of water they should bring. They just sailed and said, that's what we're going to do. Uh, Christopher so Columbus. How far we get? Yeah, exactly. Can you imagine the boldness that you have to have to do something like that in a wooden boat? And there's a handful of guys on that boat who aren't so worried about starving as much as they are worried about falling off the edge of the earth. Right, because that's what they believed. Yes. Now, Christopher Columbus, uh, who was actually an Italian, um, uh, he um, basically uh, theorized that the earth was, I think, 4,000 kilometers smaller than it, than it is. And he thought that um, if he sailed, like, you know, they were, they were discovering, discovering, again, in quotes, hard quotes, discovering India that it existed or rediscovering because Alexander the Great had been in there and that sort of thing. So from a Eurocentric percent, uh, perception, you know, how do we get all the riches of India, all the spices, the silks, the everything else that they loved about India and trading with, with India? How do we get that to Spain faster? And in fact, Christopher Columbus wanted to do that to it, for Italy. Uh, but the Italians turned him down, and I think the French turned him down too. But the Spanish Empire, which was the greatest empire in the world at that time, said, yeah, we'll fund the expedition. Wasn't it, yes. stupid question, wasn't it the Portuguese? Portuguese had a big empire as well, but Spain was, I think, more powerful oh, at that okay. point at that point you know more than me um 
uh, or was going to be anyway, was poised to be. So they send him this way and he runs into North America and he calls, you know, they call, you know, we don't call them Indians anymore, but he calls them Indians because he thinks it's India. He thinks it's just the other side. And um, I mean, I don't know the, you know, the 1492 Columbus sails the ocean blue. There is a lot about how we learn history that is convenient rather than factual. It's so that you get the basics of what happened for people that don't care so that at least they go, they know, okay, so like, I guess we've known about this place for 500 years and I don't have to think about it ever again. I don't care. What's Kim Kardashian up to? You know, what's, what's my favorite hockey team up to? Most people just do not give a shit. So the way they teach history oftentimes, because history requires nuance, it requires uh, 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 reading things, several different sources on the same subject, uh, and it requires a, um, an ability uh, and a desire to see things outside of the lens of the era that you grew up in. And so the reason Columbus is so easy is because he was the European from the not barbarian North, uh, quote unquote again, uh, that, that settled. And, and you have to remember this about the Vikings too. The reason that they never got any credit for quote unquote settling, because again, they didn't settle anything that was already settled. They just happened to show up and, and put some roots down as well. They didn't have a written language. So, a lot of what we know about Viking culture or what we think we know about Viking culture is conjecture. We don't know all about the rituals. We don't know how they came up with their boats, how we came up with, like, we, we know how they built them, but we don't know who they, who invented them. Like we didn't, they just didn't have that, that sort of record keeping thing until um, missionaries uh, uh, went up into Denmark, into Sweden, into Finland um, and Norway, obviously. And, and, uh, and, and basically Christianized it. And it was a very vicious process when that happened. Um, so when, you know, Leif Erikson and other, from what I understand anyway, when that, uh, when that happened, um, you know, it's hard to take credit for something if you don't write it down, especially back then. And I think that's probably why. Um, and, and I bet you for four or 500 years, Europeans just had no idea that the, the Vikings had been there. And it's only recently that we're like, oh, hey, that's Viking stuff in North America. Weird. How could that have happened? And then you go, but that would just be, that's all I have. <laughs> I run out of space. That was, that was very good. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> along the similar vein, uh, the Easter Island heads is uh, weird, really, right? It's what interesting. Is that? It's, yeah. Where, where is that, Adam? Easter Island is in, uh, is it off the coast of Nova Scotia? Is it in Canada? Let me look. Um, it's, there is a really shitty history channel show on it too. Curse of Easter. Or, there's Oak Island, Easter Island. Chile. Oh, oh wait, that's Chile. So I got my islands mixed up. But yes, the, the heads are crazy. And the story behind the heads is crazy. Oh, those little head things. Those yeah. rock head things. Yes, because they go down like 20 or 30 feet. Yes. What? So that is the, that's the crazy thing to me is, so the Easter Island heads exist. They're these giant rock heads yep. on this island that I'm now looking. It's owned by Chile, I guess, but it's like in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And these giant rock heads. They don't know how they got there, whatever, whatever, or at least for a while they didn't. And it was only recently, I want to say within like the last five years, maybe even two, that they decided to dig around them and they discovered, oh, they have entire bodies. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? How do you, what? <laughs> you yeah. didn't think to check? You didn't think to look? You weren't, you didn't bring a shovel? <laughs> what? That's insane. And then I, didn't I see something where maybe this we should um, research. Didn't, didn't I see something once where the theory they uh, were looking through or like their best research is they were trying to figure, okay, where did these friggin' heads come from? And one of the things I saw was Africa. It's possible. I mean, it had a thriving population. Like Timbuktu uh, at one point was one of the preeminent trade capitals of the world in the 1500s. Yeah, but Easter Island nowhere near africa <laughs> <laughs> well that's the thing right they were extremely wealthy right possible it's, right it is it's all fascinating some of that stuff that's just that's just lost to history or maybe maybe not like it's mm -hmm. lost to history for us now until we find it that's right that's right anything else jess oh that stuff's cool other questions all other good. Than history. all right well that's it for us today um jess, steve you want to wrap this up that is it for this one 
Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell all your friends that if the show starts at 2, that's when you should probably show up. <laughs> Can we go to Easter Island and film a YouTube video? Uh, it'd be pretty You'd tough. Be to be dope. Can we, can no, we eat actually, a bunch of hot dogs on Easter Island? Oh, maybe. I feel like I read something about it not being very nice. There. <laughs> oh. Wow. All right. Guys, I'll see you later. on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle at Adam W-Y-L-D-E and at Jesse Blake. Brought to you by Panago Pizza. Order at Panago.com and stuff your face with deliciousness. Connection complete.